Greetings from the Book of Days project. Today is March the 7th. Born on this day, Sir John Fontescue Alland in 1670 and Antonio Sanchez in 1699. Died on this day, the Roman Emperor Antoninus Pius in 1602 in Lorium. It is the feast day of Saints Perpetua and Felicitas Martyrs at Carthage in 2-3. 203, that is St. Paul the Simple, Anchoret, Abbot, in 330, and St. Thomas Aquinas, Doctor of the Church and Confessor, in 1274, we all read St. Thomas of Aquinas, one time or another in college, do we not? Very good, I still got the book. Um, let's talk of things noteworthy on this day, March 7th, as entered into the Book of Days. On the 7th of March, 1766, he died. And this is Mary Mogg of the Rose Tavern in Walkingham, who had been 40 years before the subject of a draw ballad by Mr. Gay, in association, as is believed, with Pope, uh, Alexander Pope, and Swift. This ballad almost immediately found its way into print through the medium of Mist's Journal of August 27, 1726, prefaced, prefaced with a notice stating that, quote, It was writ by two or three men of wit, who have diverted the public both in prose and verse, upon the occasion of their lying at a certain inn at Wokingham, where the daughter of that house was remarkably pretty, and whose name is Molly Mogg. And thus follows some verse. The schoolboy delights in a play day. The schoolmaster's joy is to flog. The milkmaid's delight is in May day. But mine is in sweet Molly Mog. Will o wisp leads the traveller a gadding through ditch and through quagmire and bog. No light can ever set me a padding but the eyes of my sweet Molly Mog. For guineas and other men's breeches, your gamesters will palm and will cog. But I envy them none of their riches, so I palm <laughs> my sweet Molly Mog. The heart that has half wounded is raging, but here and there leaps like a frog. But my heart can never be changing, it's so fixed on my sweet Molly Mog. I know that by wits tis recited that women at best are a clog, but I'm not so easily frighted from loving my sweet Molly Mog. <laughs> a letter when I am indicting comes Cupid and gives me a jog, and I fill all my paper with writing of nothing but sweet Molly Mog. I feel I'm in love to distraction. My senses are lost in a fog. <laughs> and then nothing can find satisfaction but in thoughts of my sweet Molly Mog. If I would not give up three graces, I wish I were hanged like a dog and to court all the drawing room faces for a glance at my sweet Molly Mog. For those faces want nature and spirit and seem as cut out of a log. Juno, Venus, and palaces merit Unite in my sweet Molly Mog. Where Virgil arrived with his Phyllis, writing another echo log, <laughs> both as Phyllis and fair Amaryllis, he'd give my sweet, sweet Molly Mog. When she smiles on each guest like her liquor, then jealousy sets me agog. To be sure, she's a bit for the vicar. So I shall lose my sweet Molly Mog. It appears that the ballad, perhaps to be to the surprise of its authors, attained instant popularity. Molly and the Rose at Wokingham became matter of public interest, and literary historians have not since disdained to inquire into the origin of the verses. We learn that Swift was at the time on a visit to Pope at Twickingham while preparing for the publication of his Travels of Lemo Gulliver, Gulliver's Travels, that Gay joined his two brothers, Bards, and that the tuneful trio were occasionally at the Rose Inn in the course of their excursions that summer. The 
Landlord John Mogg had two fair daughters, Molly and Sally, of whom Sally was in reality the center of, uh, what was she? Oh, she was in reality the cruel beauty, the cruel one that was referred to in the, in the ballad. But the wits were too far gone to distinguish, and so the honor, if honor it be, has clung to Molly, who, after all, died a spinster at the age of 66. There's a lesson to you, use. The inn had, in these later days, its Pope's room and its chair called Pope's chair, and there was an inscription on a pane of glass said to have been written by Pope. The house, however, is now transformed into a mercer's shop. Under the snow, it is well ascertained fact that snow affords a comparatively warm garment in intensely cold weather. This is difficult for non-scientific persons to understand, but it is based on the circumstance that snow, on account of its loose, fluculent nature, conducts heat slowly. Accordingly, under this covering, exactly as under a thick woolen garment, the natural heat of the body is not dissipated rapidly, but retained. Instances are abundant to show that Snow really protects substances from cold of great intensity. Farmers and gardeners well know this, and knowing it, they do value a good, honest fall of snow on their fields and their gardens in the winter. There are not the same tests to apply in reference to the human body, nevertheless. The fact is equally undeniable. The newspapers err every winter record examples. Thus, the Yorkshire papers contained an account in 1858 of a snowstorm at or near Market Wayton, in which a woman had a um, remarkable experience of the value of a snow garment. On the 7th of March, today, she was overtaken by the storm on the neighbor's moors and was gradually snowed up, being unable to move after, excuse me, either forward or backwards. Thus, she remained 43 hours, cold as she, of course, was, the snow Nevertheless, uh, prevented the cold from assuming a benumbing tendency, and she was able to the last to keep a breathing place about her head. On the second day after, a man crossing the moor saw a woman's bonnet on the snow. He soon found there was a living woman beneath the bonnet, and the course of judicious treatment restored her to health. The miraculous powers of snow and... The Delights of Sweet Molly Mog. Yours for consideration on this day, March 7th, from the Book of Days Project.